Oh, hi, Graham. Wow, this is a Hello, great Andrew. looking table. Thank you. And uh, so it looks like we're going to play an English Civil War game. That's correct. This is uh, Stilton near Peterborough in August 1645. Uh, the King is marching south from Stamford, heading for Huntingdon, and coming up the road to meet him is a force of newly raised roundhead cavalry and they're going to end up having a skirmish. So lots of round head, roundheads and cavaliers then, and muskets and pikes, that kind of thing. Uh, there's no infantry involved in this fight. It's a purely cavalry skirmish. Uh, the King's force did have some infantry, but they're way back up the road, along with all their pikes in a wagon. So they play no part in this. There Ooh. may have been dragoons as part of the King's force, um, but we're not really sure about that, although in terms of the game, we've included those. The parliamentarian force was one regiment of a number of troops who were well equipped, back breast and uh, pistols, well armed and well led by experienced officers, but they'd never fought before. Wow. So a cavalry skirmish in a village, that sounds as though it could be quite messy. and. Um, Yes, yeah, so perhaps a challenge to recreate with the war games rules that we have at the moment. Um, a little bit though about the character of the personalities involved. Um, what sort of people were they? Well, on the king's side, his vanguard, his uh, force that was sent down the road to clear the way was led by Sir Marmaduke Langdale, who was a very experienced Royalist cavalry officer who'd fought at Master Moore and Naseby, although the troops he was leading they ran away at Naseby, so their morale might be a bit fragile. This was the King's flying army. He'd lost at Naseby and gone straight off down to the southwest. And then news came to him of Montrose's victories in Scotland. And he thought there might be an opportunity to go north, pick up recruits in Yorkshire, which he'd been promised. He got as far as Doncaster and then realised parliamentarian forces were converging on him, so he decided. He was not going to be able to get to Scotland. The recruits had been promised didn't turn up, and so he headed back south again. Well, that's very interesting, Graham. Um, a lot of detail there. It sounds as though you've made a lot of research, but how do we know that you haven't just made this up in your head? What evidence is there? Uh, we know the names of the parliamentary officers because they were written down. In fact, they were interviewed by the royalists themselves. Major Gibbs was captured and he was interviewed by Sir Henry Slingsby and the officers were given by Richard Simmons who wrote the other diary because he took a great interest in the status of those he fought against. He was very conscious that he should only be fighting other gentlemen and he wrote down their names and the leader of the parliamentarians was one Richard Le Hunt who'd fought from the very beginning of the Civil War. He'd been at Master Moor and Naseby and survived. He'd been at the Siege of Crowland. He'd fought in the campaigns in Lincolnshire. He'd even put down a rebellion or a mutiny in Wisbeach mm. earlier on. This was a very experienced officer and yet he was only 25. Golly, that is very young, isn't it? But he sounds a really interesting character. Um, what, what was he like in, in real life and, and, and the, the type of period that it was? Um, how did he go about living his life? Richard the Hunt was the youngest son of Gentry. His father had been Lord Lieutenant of Suffolk. He was born into that kind of family that you might think of these days as the hunting, shooting, fishing crowd. He would have ridden a horse since he was five. He'd have known how to shoot a pistol and would have known how to fence. But being the youngest son, he was unlikely to have actually inherited anything. And in fact, his elder brother, Sir John Lunt, actually fought on the royalist side and raised the regiment of foot for the king in 1642. Quite a religious guy, or...? We don't really know, but later on in life, he did promise to build a church for Protestant settlers in Ireland. And he wouldn't have got as far as he did without being religious in the sense that he had to fit in with the Puritans that surrounded Cromwell. So you're, you're kind of insinuating that might have been a career move rather than anything uh, within his own character? We don't know. Uh, but he starts out as an ensign in a company of dragoons 
which was started by his half-brother. They shared the same mother. So in 1642, Sir Anthony Irby, our Boston MP, raises a unit of dragoons and Richard joins as the standard bearer. Irby's dragoons take part in the Stormy of Crowland. Mm. During this same period, this is where Richard actually puts down a mutiny in Wisbeach and is awarded five pounds by the Burgesses for suppressing that mutiny. Doesn't sound a lot these days for putting down a, a mutiny. It was either Hobart's or Palgrave's regiments who both had form for similar activity later on in the war. We don't know which regiment it was that mutinied. He fought at Newark as put under the command of Colonel Rossiter and was actually involved in a successful charge against Rupert's cavalry during the Battle of Newark. But the Eastern Association lost that battle in the long run. He then joins Fleetwood's regiment in the Eastern Association, which goes on to become part of the new model. He's fighting at Marston Moor and at Naseby. But shortly after Naseby, something happens. He gets involved in a dispute with Major Harrison, who later goes on to become one of the regicides, and he leaves the regiment under somewhat of a cloud. He seems to have been accused of financial irregularities, but that was often used as an excuse to get rid of officers who didn't have the right doctrine, perhaps. So you don't think that Stilton was um, an opportunity for him to prove himself again? I certainly think it might have been, because a year after he leaves Sorry, two months after leaving the new model, he's back in the field again at the head of a newly raised regiment of Eastern Association horse. So whatever the reason for him leaving the new model, it didn't do his career any harm. In fact, it saw him promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Mm, that's fascinating. Um, he then takes part in the fight at Stilton. He retreats with the remaining troops through uh, Huntingdon to Cambridge. Um, and then a year later, Parliament summons his regiment to get ready to go to Ireland to fight there. The regiment refuses to go until they've all been paid their back pay. <laughs> Parliament then disbands the um, regiment, but this is not a blot on uh, Richard's career because he's then invited to take command of a regiment of foot that's been newly raised for service in Ireland. He marches them across the country from East Anglia to Chester, they cross to Belfast and go into garrison duty in Northern Ireland. Later on, Cromwell himself invites Richard to be captain of his lifeguard. And they seem to have been mm. firm friends because at Cromwell's funeral, Richard is carrying the standard of Ireland close by the coffin. That's a fair. real position of honour. That's very impressive, isn't it? He must have been very close to the, to the powers at the time. Well, he seems to have been right in amongst the uh, powers that be as part of the Protectorate and the, Cromwell, and the Commonwealth, because Fleetwood was Cromwell's son-in-law, he'd been one of Fleetwood's officers, and he seems to have known all the great and the good of that period, but he's out of the country when all the mutinies start in the new model, when you've got the levellers taking place, he's absent in Ireland when the king is executed, so he's well out of the way of all that politics that happens in England during that part. He ends his career settling down in Ireland, in Munster, and eventually becomes an MP in the Irish Parliament, and uh, dies in 1668 at the age of 48, leaving a family that's now well established as landed gentry, and they're still there as landed gentry 200 years later. Um, um, the larger scene or picture, um, how does the skirmish pan out in the war overall? Well, the king brushes aside uh, Richard Le Hunt's forces at Stilton and makes his way down to Huntingdon. He pillages the town, takes up residence for two days, stays at the George Hotel there. Um, some of the local royalists uh, greet him uh, but he thoroughly pillages the town, or at least the parliamentary newspapers of the day say that he did. Now, if I could interrupt you there, please, Graham, because I've heard you're a bit of a parliamentarian yourself. And <laughs> are you being completely neutral and, and honest with this research that you've dug up? Well, the newspaper of the day was written by somebody who claimed to live in Huntingdon writing to his friend in London. 
and of course it was seized upon. You could see it, maybe see it as an early example of fake news, uh, but certainly we know for a fact that the royalists took back to Oxford with them at least two members of the town, including the mayor, because they actually owed the king money and they were held to ransom. They stole all the horses in the town and all the cattle and generally made life uncomfortable for the citizens of Huntington. But it caused absolute panic in the whole of the Eastern Association that the king was in Huntington within striking distance of Cambridge and the king only left when 10,000 men drawn from all over the eastern counties started to converge on Huntington. At that point he cut his losses, made his way back through Bedfordshire and back to Oxford. Right, so this was a very, quite a small skirmish then in, in the large scheme of things. Um, how significant? I suppose it's really difficult for us to, to tell, but uh, certainly reasonably significant. Looking at the terrain that you've set out, you've gone to a lot of effort to, to build in detail here and uh, one building that really catches my eye seems to be the pub or the, um, the large building in, uh, towards your end of the table. Does that contain anything interesting? Well that's the Bell Inn, that was built, that was there at the time, this is not an actual accurate representation of the Bell Inn in Stilton, but it was a coaching inn, very substantial building and it was one of the main buildings in Stilton. The road plan is accurate from the road plan today, which is still the same. Where the houses were at that time, we don't know. Uh, but a lot of the buildings are still there, were built in the 17th century, and it had a very wide main road, it being the main uh, road down from the north to London. So there's plenty of room. And now it's not absolutely certain that the fight was actually in Stilton itself. It may have been uh, to the south of Stilton on the road down to Huntingdon it's not clear. But one of the diaries, Simmons says it was at Stilton, whereas Slingsby is not clear where the actual fight was. But there was definitely a royalist army passed through Stilton and we've chosen to depict the game in the village itself because that seemed a bit more interesting as a game. So a cavalry fight in a village or a town um, that's going to be quite interesting from a rules point of view, so I guess we're going to have to define these hedges and how quickly we can move through them. But what, what rules have you chosen to, to play this game? Well, we chose to use uh, Pikeman's Lament because it gives a good skirmish for this level of game. It's the ideal sort of set of rules for this sort of size of game. Pikeman's Lament is, uh, contains troop types of the period and it allows you to reproduce the kind of tactics used at the time and it gives a good simulation of the sort of thing that might have happened. And you seem to have several groups of animals spread around the table. Um, are there going to be extra points for avoiding them or capturing them? And I even noticed what seems to be a beer cart on the far side of the table. Does that play a significant role in the, in the skirmish? Well to be honest Andrew, they're all for decoration because they make the table look nice and they had a certain local interest. So the coach parked behind the inn, the pigs in the pig pen, the cows in the she fields, the sheep, they're just there for local colour. The odd local dotted about. I would imagine if you've been a villager at the time and you can see royalists clattering through the town, you'd have disappeared pretty sharpish like. And they were very lucky that their intent was to get down to hunting and as fast as possible and not end up with the royalists being billeted on them overnight. So they would have waved goodbye to them as they went through the town and uh, been thankful that the Royalists didn't actually stop. Right. So let me guess, Graham. I think you'll have given me the Royalist troops and you're going to take the parliamentarians and try and reverse history. Uh, well, that's correct. <laughs> because I'm at heart a parliamentarian by um, the fact that I'm also a reenactor and I belong to the English Civil War Society. And although I'm a member of a, a Pike and Shot Regiment, it seemed appropriate that I should take on the role of trying to stop the King 